At the time of this encounter, I was a park ranger at a state park in Arkansas. The place was just gorgeous. Arkansas is known as the natural state, since there's so much scenic beauty there. One of the main attractions are the waterfalls. Arkansas has about 300, and some of the best ones tend to be in more the remote and mountainous areas. Part of my job was to maintain the access points to these falls, in order to minimize risk for people coming to visit them. A lot of my day started really early. I would get on the trails first thing in the morning, to check to see if there were any hindrances. Things happen like flooded creeks, quick mud, dangerous wildlife, etc. The rainy season runs from October to May. The best time to see the waterfalls is in the rainy season, since a lot of the falls go down to a trickle in the summer. So I was out there a lot in the wet weather. My job isn't for everyone. It involved a lot of isolation and rugged terrain. I was pretty much always wearing my steel-toed wading boots and carrying climbing tools and ropes and stuff like that. I enjoyed the isolation though. I've always been an introvert and never was hesitant to get out there alone. One morning, I was headed to a pretty remote area that had been impacted by flooding and long-time water erosion. I needed to assess the damage. It had been closed to the public and we wanted to make it accessible again. I got up before sunrise and drove out. When I got there, the road went from gravel to dirt, which is common in backwoods Arkansas. Eventually the road became no longer recognizable because of some of the past mudslides and rock slides. I had to park my truck and head into the blocked area on foot. There was quite a bit of destruction on the old road and I had to bushwhack my way through a lot of spots. I eventually came up on a creek, so I knew I was on the right path. I had never actually been to this waterfall before, and I was relying on GPS, so I was glad to see the creek. I had to wade through the flooded creek for a couple of miles or so. I was really surprised when I came across an old abandoned looking vehicle next to the creek. It didn't have any license plates on it. The car was pretty beaten up. As I got closer, I saw a lot of scratches on the metal and a smashed window on one side. The window that was shattered had some type of cloth on it, and there were dark splotches all over the interior. I didn't really want to know what those were from, maybe fungus or blood. Next to the car looked like someone had made a campsite of some sort. There were some old cans in what looked like remnants of a campfire. There were large rocks around it resembling seats. I noticed that the rocks had a layer of dirt on top of them and had formed this topsoil of sorts. That meant that the rocks had not been sat on in a long time. I wasn't even sure how long the road to this place had been closed. As far as I knew, it had never been open since I had been hired for that area. It seemed that whatever had happened there had been quite a while ago, but that still doesn't ease your mind when you're in the pretty remote area all alone. No matter how much you don't mind isolation, I kept going with my bushwhack machete unsheathed in my flare gun at hand. At that point, I was out of the creek and back up on the dirt road. I hadn't gone much further when I was assaulted by this horrendous smell of blood and rotten meat. It was what I imagined a slaughterhouse would smell like. It just came out of nowhere. I started to feel this creepy presence, and I slowed my walking way down and started scanning the landscape. When I looked past the creek, I saw a gigantic animal. It was crouched over this big deer carcass. My first thought that it was a gigantic wolf, but I knew there aren't any wolves in Arkansas, and this thing was bigger than any wolf could be. It looked like a werewolf, honestly. It was bent over the carcass, eating. It had very long legs with very little fur on them. There was a huge mane around its neck, and its tail was really puffy. The head was unnaturally large and the forearms were incredibly muscular. Seriously, if you try to bring up an image of a werewolf, that's the closest I can describe it. By some miracle, it didn't seem to know that I was there. I held my breath and backed away slowly. I felt like I was barely moving. It took a long time before I felt I was far enough away to turn around and make the long track back to my truck. The whole way I was gripped by a fear more intense than I had ever felt. I had these wild thoughts going through my mind. 
like was that thing connected to the owner of that car? I didn't even want to imagine what might have happened. I notified the proper authorities about my finding of the car and sighting of the creature. I'm really not sure what measures they took to track it down, but the trail continues to be marked as off limits to this day. I've told a few people about what I saw, but honestly, what are they supposed to think? None of them has ever come across such a thing. That's why I like to turn to your channel and reassure myself that I'm not alone. I wish I had some answers for the things that happen to us on our farm, but I don't. No one does. Some things just stay a mystery, and maybe that's the scariest part, the not knowing. We had been living on the farm for generations. It was a family farm, but for whatever reason, unless my parents and grandparents didn't talk about it, the activity started up when I was already in my 30s. When you're raised on a farm, you have your own alarm clock built into your body, it seems. We'd get up as early as four, but no later than six. We'd be so tired from work the previous day that we'd fall asleep before nightfall. I really like farm life. My siblings didn't. So I inherited our farmhouse. In a way, I never really left it because I was the youngest of us all. So before I knew it, my parents had passed on and I was able to keep it the house and the land and all the animals. At the time, I wasn't married or anything, so I had a few of my friends live on the farm with me. They grew up in our small area, and I had gone to school with them. They weren't married either, so what better things did we have to do? We didn't have any restrictions or obligations to anyone. We could just live a peaceful life, and we did for a while. We had all sorts of animals. We had a couple of horses, Valentina and Katie. We had some chickens, some goats, and some pigs, and we had plenty of cows. Of course, we had been used to predators getting into our livestock every now and then. Once, we had to hunt down a bear who kept coming to the farm to take our pigs. Our pig pen was down and out towards the foothills. It was easy for the bear, but we did have to put that bear down. But with all that said, I think I know when my animals are being picked off by something like a bear and not by something that we can't identify to this day. The first time it happened, there had been a mess in the chicken coop. It wasn't terribly late, so a few of us were still settling down from the day. We heard some squawking and commotion, so we thought it was a bear that we hadn't found yet. We ran out to the coop. Whatever it was, was gone, but it left a mess of feathers and chicken corpses all over the place. The first and the strangest thing about these events that we had noticed is that the bodies had been left. If this was an animal predator, they would have taken the entire body of the chicken to eat, but they didn't. They killed the chickens, but left the remains. It didn't make sense to me. And when we got closer, things made less sense. The chicken corpses didn't appear to have any wounds or claw marks. Well, not at first. We couldn't figure out what happened to the chickens. We thought that they could have possibly died from some sort of disease. That wouldn't have explained the commotion of the loose feathers everywhere, but it seemed more reasonable than a bear taking the chickens out of the coop, killing them by an unknown means, and leaving their bodies. So I called my animal doctor friend who helps me when my animals are sick. They said they'd be down the following afternoon. When they came to inspect the chickens, they were in shock too. They said that all the blood had been drained and that there were two small puncture wounds that were hidden under the feathers. The chickens weren't sick, but something strange happened to them. The doctor couldn't help us figure it out though. So for a few nights, we took turns keeping an eye on the chicken coop. Nothing happened during this time, so we figured whatever had caused the death of the several chickens must have moved on. We got back to our daily lives. Several months had passed. We were starting to get back into the warmer weather when one of our cows collapsed at midday. We weren't sure if it was dehydration, illness, or something else. And at the time, I hadn't even thought about the incident with the chickens. But my doctor friend came out again and realized that the cow had a very low blood count. And that's when more puncture wounds were found, this time on the cow. Eventually, it moved on to other animals. We couldn't seem to stop it. 
and some of our animals eventually started losing square sections of their skin. I'm not sure if this was done by the same culprit, but it was really taking a toll on all of us at the farm. At this point, I knew something was picking off our livestock, but we didn't know what or how to prevent it. We'd stay up late watching for any sign of what might be doing it. We once thought we spotted something, but it turned out that it was nothing more than a mangy coyote looking for rabbits. Whatever it was seemed like it was very intelligent. It was as if it knew we were watching, because we never did see the culprit. Many more of our animals did die, but eventually the killing stopped. Like I said, my parents and grandparents never experienced anything like this. And if they did, they certainly didn't talk about it. I'm not sure if the creature is an animal or a person or something else. I'm not sure if it hunts areas in cycles or if it gets tired of certain areas and leaves. Who knows? Maybe the one terrorizing our farm died. But whatever it was, it hasn't returned yet. I lived in Montana at the time this happened, near the mountains. I lived in a small cabin with my wife and our two dogs. It was normally very quiet, and nothing really happened out there. One night, my wife ended up staying late at work to cover for someone who called out sick. I was at the cabin alone. It wasn't something that was unusual. I've spent plenty of alone time in that cabin before, and it's never been something that's bothered me at all. I was laying in bed getting ready to go to sleep when the dogs started barking. I got up thinking that they must just need to use the bathroom really quick. Both of them were sitting calmly in front of the front door barking. It was kind of like they were waiting for someone to give them treats. I walked over to them to see what they were looking at. And when I touched Penny, my Australian Shepherd Rescue, she bit me. She'd never bitten anyone in her life. And I was honestly shocked by it. Right after, she seemed to snap out of it. And she came over to comfort me knowing that she had just hurt me. It was very bizarre that she had just bitten me. My other dog, Roscoe, hadn't moved from the spot the entire time. I didn't want to move him and risk him biting me too, so I shook some treats and he left the spot and went to eat them. I looked out the window and I didn't see anything that would have alerted them like that. It was weird. I brought them into my room and laid down on the bed with them. Eventually, I ended up falling asleep. The next day I told my wife about what happened, and we kind of assumed that they must have heard something outside. A raccoon, a possum, or anything. Later that night, I just finished cleaning up after dinner, and I went to take the garbage out to the bin. I heard something rattling in the distance. I turned to look at where it was coming from, and it sounded like it was coming from our garage. The garage was detached, and we used it mostly for storage. But when I went out there, the garage door was open for some reason. I walked towards it and tried to peer inside to see if I could see if there was anything in there. I assumed it was a raccoon or something. I heard this strange chattering noise from the garage. I froze in place when I heard it. It didn't sound like anything that I've ever heard before. I stopped walking towards it and just turned back to go inside the house. If it was some rabid raccoon or something, it was probably best just to call an exterminator. I told my wife and we decided that that would be best. I called an exterminator in the morning and they were able to send someone out that day. I had them take a look in the garage and around the house. They didn't see any signs of wildlife. No raccoons, opossums, stray cats, nothing. I definitely thought that was weird. I know I heard something in that garage. It was all starting to feel very strange. I went back inside and my wife was working the night shift again and I was expecting to be home alone until 3 a.m. I brought the dogs into my room and got ready for bed. I was nearly asleep when I heard the dogs barking again. I opened up my eyes and saw them sitting in front of the window, just like they were a couple days ago. I jumped up and peeked through it to see what it was that they were barking at. I didn't see anything outside at first. There was nothing running around or digging in the trash, but I looked up, and then I saw it. In the sky, I could see these three red lights circling and dancing around. It was close to the cabin, strangely close. Part of me wanted to go outside and investigate it further, but another part of me wanted to run and hide in the closet. I kept my eyes on the lights, and they disappeared out of nowhere. When they both vanished, both of the dogs stopped barking. 
I couldn't sleep that night. All I could think about was those lights and wonder why they were affecting my dogs like that. I told my wife and she thought it must have been some sort of dream. I was starting to believe it for myself and I actually felt a little crazy. But after about a week later, the same thing happened. I jumped up as soon as I saw the dogs barking and this time I decided I would have to go see what it was. I ran to the porch and looked up at the sky. The lights danced and coalesced in the air. It was almost hypnotizing to look at. I wanted to run away when I saw them, but I was frozen in place. I woke up the next morning in bed with the worst headache I've had in my entire life. I was next to my wife and wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I couldn't remember how I got there. I remembered getting out of bed and going to look outside at these lights. Everything else just went dark. I woke up and told my wife what had happened and she thought it was just a dream I must have had. My wife didn't believe anything I said about what happened, and she couldn't understand why I was so fixated on it. I just can't shake the feeling that something happened to me that I can't remember. I feel like I need to find out, but I don't even know where to begin. Hi Donovan, I have kind of a different story for you. This happened last year when I was out behind my house. I live near Charlestown, West Virginia, and I have about 20 acres that's mostly wooded. We hunt on my property, and when I say we, I mean my two brothers and my dad. Also, sometimes my cousins come join us too. I mostly archery hunt, and this happened late fall of 2021 during archery. Now this day, I was out by myself. It was sometime in early November. Now let me preface this by saying that I love listening to Joe Rogan's podcast. I'm always listening to it when I work. And the reason I say that is because I remember this one episode where Joe was talking with someone about centipedes and how he was so freaked out by them. They were talking about a centipede killing a mouse and how crazy it was. This was a while ago, maybe two or three years ago when I heard that episode. So my encounter happens when I'm in my tree stand. I've been there since early morning and there wasn't that much activity. Then I heard something small coming through the woods. It was a rabbit that just wandered below me and he was eating some grass. He didn't even notice me from above. Then about a minute later, I heard something else coming through the woods. This time though, it sounded bigger. I was thinking that maybe it's a deer or bobcat or even a bear. It was making quite a bit of noise. Now, the leaves were mostly on the ground at this point in November, but not completely off the trees. I could hear the leaves rustling, and then this thing comes into my view that looks like a ginormous centipede. I kid you not, this thing had to be at least three feet in length. I've never seen anything like it before in my life. It's running probably about 15 miles per hour, which doesn't sound like much, but but that's really fast for something that size moving through the woods. It came barreling around this tree and stopped. Then it lifted up the front part of its body, as to sense its surroundings. It could sense that rabbit that I saw. At this point, the rabbit knew something was there because he could hear it. He was looking all alert, but he couldn't see this thing from where he was standing. This centipede looking thing darted for the rabbit and grabbed it and ran off. It like grabbed it with the front part of its body while it was running on the back part of its body. The strangest thing that I've ever seen. I don't understand what it was, how it got there, or if it's an invasive species. All I know is that I don't ever want to see that thing again. If it would bite you or sting you, I don't know, whatever those things do, I'm sure it would cause some serious pain. Lord knows I can't run that fast. It was like something out of an alien movie. It was scary as hell. Anyways, take care and thanks for reading my story. I don't want to give too many specifics. I'm afraid those guys with guns will come asking questions if I do. I live in upstate New York and I'm fortunate enough to have miles of peaceful hiking trails within a half hour drive. It was a Sunday morning and I wanted to get out and hike a trail that I hadn't been on for a while. 
This particular trail was usually a little more crowded, so I avoided it, but it had some beautiful vistas, and I was in need of some soul soothing after this week at work. That morning, I followed my usual pre-hike routine and stopped for a cup of coffee at the diner at the edge of town. I was good friends with the owner, and I always let him know when I was heading out for a day trip and what time I would be back. Hiking 101, always let someone know when you're hitting the trail. Leaving town and heading towards the mountains, a group of three park ranger SUVs with flashing lights overtook and passed me on the road. Seeing them wasn't too unusual. After all, there are a lot of state parks in the vicinity, but they seemed to be in quite a rush, and I'm pretty sure they didn't have the standard National Park Service emblem painted on their vehicle anywhere. I had a 45-minute drive, so I put the news on to catch up on some recent events. I couldn't stomach more than 10 minutes of that, though. As soon as I killed the radio, I heard this noise coming from straight over ahead. I slowed down and poked my head out the window, looking up, and sure enough, there were two helicopters heading in the same direction that I was. Just great. Probably a missing hiker. I know it's selfish, and I'll admit it, but my only thought in that moment was, I hope they hadn't closed off the trail. I'd blown off plans with some co-workers so I could hike this trail, and if I drove all the way out here just to turn around, that would stink. When I finally got there, I parked in this small lot at the trailhead. I was relieved to see the path wasn't roped off, and there was only one car there, so I would have the trail basically all to myself. I heard the choppers once or twice after I'd gotten started, but I didn't see them again and they sounded pretty far off. Hopefully they found whoever was missing, and quickly. I just wanted a quiet walk in the woods without any modern interruptions. I'd even left my phone in the car since I didn't get service anyway. I tend to look down when I'm hiking, on the lookout for any roots or rocks that cause me to trip, only looking up often enough to ensure I didn't walk face first into a branch. I'd been going this way for a good hour and a half when I saw it. Some kind of mega-sized paw print stuck out clearly on the trail. I had seen black bears while I was out before, and though not common, it happened enough for me to want to carry bear spray in my pack. I followed the prints another few feet, and they went off trail. I'm not a hunter or a tracker, so I couldn't follow them off the trail. I was a little freaked out, but I'd never heard of anyone actually being attacked. I just decided to carry my bear spray in hand and keep tracking. I had only gone a few more miles before I decided to take another rest and grab a drink of water. The sun was pretty high in the sky at this point, and it was getting hot. I found a big enough rock to sit under a tree and sat down for a minute. As soon as I did, I heard shouting coming from up ahead around this bend in the trail. It sounded like a man's voice. I couldn't make out what he was saying. I was worried that maybe he had seen the bear or something. But then I remembered the potential missing hiker and thought it must be them or maybe somebody who found them and was yelling for help. I stashed my canteen and started off in a trot towards the voice. I kept my bear spray handy though, just in case. I rounded the bed and was immediately hit with this wall of stench like I've never smelled before. It was so bad that I actually stopped in my tracks, trying to hold back this morning's coffee. The shouting was getting louder and now I could pick up what sounded like multiple voices. Between trying not to puke and trying to listen to the yelling, I only first caught the thing out of the corner of my eye. Something had stepped off from behind a large tree onto the trail only about 20 feet away. Something massive. Turning to give it my full attention, I was, well, I can't really describe what I felt. Terror is probably the best I can get. Whatever this thing was, had to be at least 9 feet tall. Thick curly brown hair covered it from head to toe, and its arms had to be at least 4 feet long. Everything about this screamed ape or some kind of prehistoric creature, except its face. I could make out what definitely looked like humanish features, just bigger and oversized, I don't know. I couldn't help but to make eye contact. The thing was staring right at me. I was squeezing the can of bear spray so hard that I thought I was going to break it. I didn't even notice the smell at this point. The creature slowly raised its arms into the air and I braced for whatever was about to happen. 
It stopped with its arms stretched out, palms facing me. The kind of gesture you would make to someone if you're trying to avoid a fight. The creature's eyes were wide, and its lips seemed like they were trembling. I think it was afraid. Another shout came from close by up the trail. The look of terror passed this creature's face. It gave me one last look and then bolted off the path into the undergrowth. I should have heard it crashing through the forest long after that, being how big it was. But almost suddenly as it disappeared, I stopped hearing it. I stood there in shock. What the hell had I just witnessed? Not a minute later, three guys came running down the trail towards me and slowed down as soon as they saw me. These guys were dressed in all black, each one carrying an assault rifle. Now, I'm not much of a gun guy, but these things look like they would be used in a war zone. They approached me and started hammering me with questions. What was I doing here? Was I alone? What was my name? I gave them my name, my real name. Looking back, I really wish I hadn't. But when you see something like I just saw, and then three armed men appear from nowhere and begin questioning you, you're really not thinking strategically. They told me that there was a bear attack nearby and that I needed to turn around and leave the trail immediately. I had absolutely no objections. When we parted, I heard one of them say over the radio, civilian returning to the trailhead, ETA 90 minutes. I made it in 60. I heard the helicopters a lot more on the way back. When I got back to my car, there was another guy sitting on a dirt bike, dressed in all black and sporting the same type of rifle. The other car was gone, and the guy didn't say a word to me just watched me as I got back in my Jeep and drove off. I got back home and just sat on the couch the rest of the day. I closed all the blinds too. I didn't even want to glance outside. I checked the local news a few days afterwards and never saw any mention of a bear attack. I asked around with a few trail vets that I knew, and one or two had heard the same rumors, but nothing concrete. I haven't been hiking since, not on that trail or any other. I think about that incident almost every single day. I remembered how scared that thing was, and how it could have ripped me apart too if it wanted to. I wonder if it got away. Honestly, I hope it did. Hey Donovan, thank you for reading this. I don't know if I'll ever be able to truly get over the experience I had, but I may as well share it to try to get some relief. Earlier this year, Honestly, towards the beginning, I saw some unexplainable stuff. More specifically, an unexplainable entity. I say entity because truthfully, I don't know if there is any other way to describe what it was. It was so out there, but I'll start at the beginning. During the winter months, my family and I stay up at a lodge in Nebraska with my grandparents. It's kind of peaceful there most years, and I was having a nice time during the first few days. It was a week where there wasn't a ridiculous amount of snow. The weather was kind of letting up, a generally positive atmosphere. Then one night, out of absolutely nowhere, I experienced one of the most terrifying moments of my life. My room in the lodge is at the top, in the attic. See, I've always loved having that room, because there's this massive bay window that opens up, and when you climb out of it, you can actually sit on the roof and look at the stars. I did this all the time. So being on the roof was never intimidating for me or anything like that. So on this night, I'm doing my normal nightly routine of getting ready for bed. Everything is fine at first until I hear this crazy loud buzzing. Buzzing as in bugs. But during the winter, there at least, there are hardly ever any bugs around. It's too cold. I'm sitting there then wondering where this sound could possibly be coming from. It's so intense that it sounds like it could be a swarm of some kind. I'm not someone who is particularly afraid of bugs, but with buzzing like that, anyone would be a bit creeped out. The rough bit was when I realized that the intensity of the buzzing was not a swarm. It was not coming from a large group of bugs, but rather one large bug monster thing. Our cabin is in a complex of similar ones, all set up in a row. Each is built in a similar style, and so each has a roof. I heard a loud slam sound on the roof next to mine. Slowly I turned, and I'm still coming to terms with what I saw. Standing there on the roof next to mine was the source of this buzzing. 
It stood probably about five feet tall, the height of a middle schooler, but that didn't make it seem less intimidating. It looked human-esque in shape, its limbs, but those limbs were covered in what looked like feathers or fur, some kind of black material that was certainly not skin. It kept looking at me the whole time, making this noise, examining me. I was freaked. I wanted to scream, but I also was a bit frozen trying to process what it was that I was looking at. It had a face that was indescribable, almost as though it had no face at all. But what it did have were eyes. I see its eyes now. Every time I'm scared, every time I have a nightmare. They were red and they were massive. They were also reflective. You could tell since the moon was kind of bouncing off them. I wasn't quite sure what to do or how to react. So instead, I simply kept watching in hopes that it would eventually get bored and go away. But it didn't. I don't know how long we sat out there, but I can tell you that I nearly froze to death on how cold it was getting. I didn't want to move though. I couldn't. So for at least 10 minutes, we had this staring match. Then, like a miracle, it finally decided it was done looking at me. I had seen its wings laying against its body, nearly touching its feet with their length the whole time. I had wondered what they would look like outstretched or in flight, as scary as it was. I found that out when its wings became outstretched. The wingspan was something absolutely sickening, certainly more than the length of the creature's body. It was odd though, because unlike the rest of its features, the wings on it didn't look like traditional insect-like wings. Instead, they were like some impressive leathery material, certainly looking strong and not easily breakable. I wondered what the hell it was doing there and where it came from, but truthfully, I hope I never know. I watched it take flight, still making that sickening noise that makes me jump anytime there's a butterfly around me. It flapped around in a circle a few times, and I didn't know if it was trying to tell me something or if it was simply trying to show off. When it was out of my field of vision, only then I started climbing back inside. My hands and feet felt like they were totally numb. For the rest of the night, I just stood there inside at the bay window looking out, simultaneously trying to catch another glimpse and hoping I never saw it again. All at once, I was disgusted, elated, curious and confused. I never did end up seeing it again. I've also never sat up there again on the roof. I'm afraid that if I do, I'll call it back somehow. Hi Donovan. I've been listening to your show for a while now, and I'm finally writing in with me and Goldie's story. It's just as much as her story as it is mine. See, Goldie is a golden retriever who's been with our family for over five years now, and she loves to go camping with us. I have a travel trailer that I use quite a bit. Almost every weekend in the summer, my son and my wife and I are camping at some campground. We live in Ohio, but we do go all over to camp. This one weekend in June, we didn't travel too far, and we camped at Mohican State Park. It was the second day that I was there. I was taking Goldie for a walk along the river trail. We had been walking for about 30 minutes when I heard something from off the trail come barreling through the woods. I thought it was a deer or possibly a black bear, but then it stops, like it must have caught wind of us or something. Goldie steps out in front of me and starts doing this low growl at the woods. She sensed that something was off right away and the motion from this thing startled her at first. And I'm standing there and I can't see anything because the woods are pretty thick in that area. I started to pull at her lead, signaling to her that we need to turn around and go back, but she wouldn't budge. Then I start to hear this thing coming out of the woods. It's slowly making its way to the trail. I start yelling in case it's a bear saying, get out of here bear. But what happened next? shocked me to my core. I'm yelling and Goldie is there growling like I've never seen her before. She's such a mild-mannered dog and a total sweetheart. This monstrous, and I mean monstrous figure, comes walking out of the woods making all kinds of noises while it's walking. Twigs and branches are snapping all over the place. It's covered in this long dark fur from head to toe, 
except for its face, and it stares right at me with its beady eyes and it raises its one hand. Now, I'm not sure what it was doing, but it put its arm over its head and it stood there making this grunting sound. Goldie at this point is going nuts. She's barking her head off and it seems like this thing is annoyed at all the barking and starts to cover its ears. I'm trying to hold on to the lead as best as I can because Goldie just won't stop. This giant beast looks at Goldie and then turns and goes back into the woods. She wouldn't leave for another minute or so because I think she wanted to make sure the threat was gone. We eventually get back to camp and I tell my wife and my kid about the entire experience. It was crazy to say the least. We ended up going home later that afternoon. I did tell one of the local rangers about the incident, but I think he just passed it off as a black bear. That thing was a Sasquatch. I have no doubt in my mind. And my sweet girl saved me from whatever that thing intended to do. I've been down on my luck plenty of times, and I've learned to never look down on people. I've been the guy on the side of the road with my thumb sticking out as cars drive on by. That's why I decided to stop that night, because I knew how he must have been feeling. I really wish I hadn't. I was on my way home from Harrisburg, heading back to Philly. I know most of the state like the back of my hand, having spent a few years as a short range delivery driver. So when I hit the stalled traffic caused by all the road work, I knew what back streets and alternate routes I could turn to. It was one of those lesser traveled roads that I encountered the man. He was slowly walking down the shoulder, thumb hung lazily in the air. At first, I drove past him, despite what I said about the looking down on people thing. I was a little bit hesitant to let somebody in my car right then. There really wasn't a whole lot around and I couldn't imagine where he was heading to or coming from. But the angel on my shoulder won the battle, and after about a mile, I made a U-turn and I pulled up alongside him. I could see through my rolled down window that he was a middle-aged guy, clean shaven with his short cropped brown hair. He was wearing jeans and a denim jacket and had a thick rucksack flung over one shoulder. He was holding something small and flat in the crook of his elbow but I couldn't make out what it was. He seemed alarmed when I first pulled up. I guess he wasn't really expecting anyone to pick him up from the side of the road. I introduced myself through the window and let him know which direction I was headed and told him he could ride with me if he wanted to. He hesitated at first, but quickly decided that it beat walking alone on a dark road in the dead of night. He opened the door and climbed in. He introduced himself as Ken and Ken smelled absolutely wretched. I wasn't sure how long he had been on the road and knew that a few days without a shower can really do a number on anyone. Not wanting to make him feel self-conscious, I just kept the windows rolled down and made some small talk. He didn't really go into details on where he was going. He said that he had family in the Northeast and that he had set out a few days ago to make the trek. I had known plenty of guys with hoboish tendencies and even had some myself. Despite all the urban legends, they usually weren't that bad. Some were even a good time to be around. They just kind of lacked guidance and ambition. And talking to Ken, it seemed like he fell short on both. After about maybe a half hour of driving down the nearly deserted road, I asked him about the thing he was carrying. He had placed it on his lap and was covering it with his hands. He became uneasy, so I dropped it. At one point though, I caught a glimpse of something in my rearview mirror. Not a light, but rather a dark shape right behind the car. I asked Ken if he saw it. He said no, but when I peeked over at him, I could see that some of the color had drained from his face. I didn't see it again until we continued on in silence, until a short while later when I had to answer nature's call. I pulled over to the side of the road and told Ken that I would be right back. He was a nice enough guy, but I took the keys with me anyway. When I went to get out of the car, Ken grabbed me by the arm and asked me to please not take long. He wasn't rough, but something in his voice struck me as odd. It sounded like fear, 
almost panic even. I assured him I would be quick and walked about 30 yards away up to the tree line. I had just started to do my business when out of the corner of my eye, I saw something darting from the wood line towards my car. Whatever it was, it was moving pretty fast. Two more formless shadows followed it an instant later. Then another one on my left. This all happened in the span of about two seconds. And before I could zip up and turn around, I heard a scream from behind me coming from my car. I spun around and was caught with a bizarre spectacle. Those darting figures were now running in a full circle around my car. The shadows weren't anything material, and in fact, even seemed to grow and shrink in size and shape. Ken locked eyes with me through the open window, staring at me in dead silence. I had the keys in my pocket, and there was no way for him to roll it up. I was too in awe of what I was seeing to make any kind of rational decision. The forms just kept racing and racing around my car, a blur of erratic shapes. Suddenly, one of the shadows dove through the window, and Ken started screaming. He had been wearing his seatbelt, and I was close enough to hear his bones shattering. The blurred form seemed to have Ken by the legs and started dragging him across the road. All the other shapes now converged with the one carrying Ken. The thing underwent some kind of sick transformation, taking on the full mass of all the combined shadows. The end result was this massive creature, probably 12 feet, if not more. It had defined legs and arms now. One hand wrapped around Ken's legs. The head seemed to be in the shape of a bull, an immense rack of antlers crowning its head. The beast moved quickly into the forest on the far side of the road. I could hear Ken's screams for some time before they faded away. I was trying to contain my terror. I realized that my entire body was shaking so violently that I cracked a tooth. I stumbled over to my car, resting against the passenger side door, and trying to decipher what in the hell just happened. I happened to be looking down through the open window, and on the floor beneath, where Ked had been sitting, there was a book. There were strange symbols on the cover, one I recognized as a pentagram. I flipped through the book and felt bile start to rise in my throat. I couldn't understand any of the writing. It was in a language I had never seen before, and it certainly wasn't Latin. The sickening part was that the ink appeared to be dried blood in some parts. Other parts actually seemed to have been written with human fecal matter. I dropped the book to the ground and ran around to my driver's side door. Before I got in though, I caught the sight of Ken's rucksack sitting in the back seat. With trepidation, I removed it and untied the flap. The bag was filled with the remains of, well, I don't know what. There were bones with meat and flesh still attached. And while I tried to tell myself that none of it was human, a part of me knew that it was. I threw the bag onto the grass as far as I could. I got in my car and drove full speed down the road not looking back once. I never went to the police. What was I going to tell them? I picked up a hitchhiker and a demon carried him off into the woods and I threw out his bag of human remains. That was probably an easy way to end up on a watch list somewhere. No, I didn't do anything at all. Ken or whoever he was was obviously mixed up in some kind of dark and evil affair, one which I wanted no part of. Whatever it was that night, it left me well enough alone, and I plan on keeping that way. I'm only telling this story so it can serve as a warning. Be careful who you stop for when driving down dark and lonely roads. I was a teenager and I was still in high school. Occasionally, my mom and I would drive around for hours to places that we didn't even know about, just aimlessly driving to some place that would get us away from everything. We found many cool areas doing this. Now, the reason for it wasn't very pleasant. I'd rather not go into details about it, but at least we have the memories we do. It was a particularly bad day. My mom picks me up from school, she got to leave work early, and she says that we were going for another drive. I never complained because I knew my mom was dealing with enough already. 
so I did everything I could to make her happy. That meant smiling and sucking it up. It also meant never complaining about spending too much time in the car. I did have siblings, but they were always with their friends. I had friends, but none that I really hung out with outside of school. I suppose I was more of a lone wolf than a social type. This meant that I was mom's only company during the tougher days. And I knew how much that meant to her. It meant a lot to me too. As we are driving, the sky gets pretty gray. It looked like we were going to be driving in the rain, and I was okay with that. My mom is driving some time before I realized that we are in the foothills. And from this area, we started heading up towards the mountains. We hadn't been to this area before. It was pretty cool. It was very green. And the road was full of all sorts of crazy twists and turns. My mom liked driving on roads like that. It made her feel invincible, I think. There's a point in time when we get to a flat area. I assumed it was the very top of this mountain. There's a road that leads straight ahead, but there's these weird gates. They sort of reminded me of those railroad gates that can open and close. They happened to be open. It looked really weird, but we were both very curious about it. So we went in. There were a few huge metal boxes that looked like transformers or something. I figured they were somehow connected to the gate that we drove through. All around us is this really cool wooded area. We followed the road for some time. Eventually, we hit a dead end. At the end of the road was this enormous body of water. It looked like a lake, but it seemed to turn into rivers that led off into two different directions. It seemed peaceful, and that's what my mom needed. We climbed out of the car and start to walk around this small area of land. If you were looking at the body of water from our car, there were different elements to notice. The first being that the area of land that we stood on obviously wrapped around the lake, but it was weird because we both couldn't walk on any of the sides. We were stuck in the dead center of the lake. This was partly due to the area on the left and the right of us being very steep and covered in rocks. There were two river type things as I mentioned, but they sort of swerved out to the northeast and northwest. It created this V shape almost. And then dead ahead of us was another area of land that was pretty far away from us. It was an interesting area for sure. I hadn't seen anything like it before. It was the most pure silence I've ever heard in my whole life. No cars, no background noise. But there weren't any other noises either, which made it kind of eerie. We were out in nature, but we couldn't hear any signs of it, like birds or crickets or any flying insects. It was dead quiet. It started to sprinkle the tiniest bit of rain, and even that sound seemed amplified. I remember my mom saying, this is weird, huh? It really was very weird. And I didn't think it could get much weirder, but it did. We looked out into the body of water and watched the small raindrops hitting the surface. The surface of the lake was super still, like freakily still. Like I've never seen water so still, not even in a bathtub. So that's what made what we saw much more horrifying. As we looked out towards this body of water, we saw something rather large splash the water upwards. The sound alone was enough to frighten me. A loud splash after hearing nothing for several minutes was quite shocking. But the enormity of whatever forced the water up was unexplainable. I don't think it could have been a fish. If it was, that fish was humongous. I hadn't noticed prior, but I noticed at this point that there was this weird series of smaller objects sitting above the water off to my left. They almost looked like a row of rocks peeking out of the water. It must have not caught my eye before, being that the sides were pretty much covered by large rocks. But as soon as we saw that splash and the gigantic ripples it created in the lake, I started to wonder if those rocks weren't really rocks at all, but the back of something large hidden under the water. All of this observation took no time at all, and if I'm being truthful, I was much too frightened to stand there much longer. My mom started to usher me into the car, saying that we needed to leave. So we got into the car and left. I would have thought that my mind was playing tricks on me. All of what we had experienced was truly, for lack of better words, creepy. 
and my mom started revisiting the events out loud as we drove. Everything she was saying was exactly what I saw too. I can still hear her words. That wasn't a fish. It couldn't have been, right? All I know is whatever it was made me so scared. I wouldn't step foot near another lake or river again. I just won't. Hey there, Donovan. I'm writing to you from Southern PA with an experience I had this fall. I think it's right up your alley. So I'm an events coordinator and I usually work with local farms. I help them organize birthday parties, hay rides, and stuff like that. It's a pretty neat job and I get to bring my family along to most of the public events at a discount. This fall, I took my parents to the annual apple picking bash at one of our bigger farms. They were only in town for the weekend and I figured it would be a nice way to relax. We were in the orchard collecting our apples and everything when this terrible smell hit me. It's hard to describe, but it was this acidic metallic reek and it was overwhelming. It happened so suddenly that it made my eyes water. The smell was so overpowering that it felt like it had knocked the wind out of me. I had to sit down for a second. My parents were fine and my mom asked me what was wrong. I couldn't explain it. I just felt really clammy and cold. It was hard to think. We were a little ways from the other customers. My mom ran off to get me some water while my dad stayed with me. I think we were both worried I was going to faint. My dad and I were uphill, so we could see over the rest of the orchard, and I realized that it had gotten quiet. When we looked down at the other customers, it looked like everyone had stopped moving. A lot of people were sitting down like I was, or just completely laid down on the ground. It was like we had all collapsed at the same time. I started to get really dizzy. Then my dad went down. I felt too weak to help him up. All I could do was wait it out and hope that my mom was okay. It felt like I was going to pass out at any moment. I don't know how long it lasted, but then the smell was gone. It got easier to breathe and I felt less shaky. I helped my dad up. Whatever happened seemed like it had been worse for him than it was for me. When we looked down at the orchard, we saw other people starting to move and help each other up. Whatever had affected us seemed to leave all at once. My dad and I stumbled down the hill. My mom hadn't made it very far. We found her leaning against a tree trying to catch her breath. I was worried because she had pretty bad asthma, but she seemed to be doing okay. All of us were just happy to be safe. My dad wanted to get out of the orchard as quickly as possible. The other customers had the same idea. There was this mad dash to get to the parking lot. Just a surge of freaked out people all trying to get out at once. My parents and I actually had to stay in the orchard even longer because of the crowd. By the time we finally got to our car, we were able to get on the highway. It was pretty dark out by then. I was a little nervous about driving so soon after that dizzy spell, but I didn't have much of a choice. Now, this particular orchard was about 30 miles out from my suburb. It was a little remote, and we had to travel on a few back roads before we could reach the highway. A lot of the other people were headed in that same direction. So at first I was just following the other cars, but then traffic stopped. We were stuck in the same spot for almost 20 minutes. People started getting out of their cars to walk to the front to see what was going on. Maybe a tree had fallen into the road or something. After walking for a while, I saw what was wrong. There was a barricade of police cruisers blocking the road and not just cruisers, they had those big tank looking vehicles, you know? The ones they'll sometimes pull out for a riot. They weren't letting anyone pass, but the police officers stayed behind the barricade. No one even came out to talk to us or direct traffic toward a different route. We were just stuck there. I asked the guy in front of me if the officers had communicated at all. He said no. I didn't want to cause a scene, so I just headed back to my car. And I gotta tell you, the longer I walked, the more freaked out I became. I had a feeling something really bad was going to happen. Or something bad already happened, and now they're just out here to clean up the loose ends. When I told my parents what I had seen, they didn't know what to do either. So we were just all waiting there, in the dark, hoping the officers would eventually get fed up and let us pass. 
And I guess they did. It took a while, but eventually the traffic started to move. I didn't know what changed until we got closer to the front. We each had to get out of the car, and we were asked questions by this doctor. And they split us up. I had to talk to a physician local to the area. My mom said she got interviewed by an army nurse. It took forever and the questions were really specific. I had to remember my entire medical history on the spot. I was scared to forget anything because I didn't know what would make them keep us there longer. Eventually, they let us pass. The drive back to my house should have only taken about an hour. Instead, it was closer to three. And by the time we got home, we were completely exhausted. No one ever came to talk to us about that mass collapse at the orchard. I don't really know what to do with this story. I feel fine, like my body didn't get affected too badly. But I think we all took part in some sort of experiment. I truly believe that. Growing up in Appalachia, you always hear stories, but you brush them off. However, the warnings that came with the stories, yeah, those you listen to, don't whistle after dark. If you hear something saying your name, no you don't. Never run in the woods. I can go on, but these are the important ones. I had always thought these were jokes, just some old wives' tales that our moms passed down to make us listen. But that all changed a few years ago, and now I tell these warnings to everyone that says they're coming to visit. It was just another day out in the trails. I had ridden them probably a thousand times in my life. I was checking out the fence line because we had a cow come up missing. I had been out for a few hours but hadn't seen anywhere that the heifer could have crossed the fence. I turned my horse around and headed back, but then I heard it. I heard my name. I stopped my mare and looked over my shoulder, but there was no one there. I just kind of shrugged it off. I figured my sister was trying to play a prank on me. I would head back to the house and let mom know that she was out there goofing off, but then I heard it again. I turned around my saddle and scanned the tree line, but I still couldn't see anyone. Sis was always afraid of the woods, so I knew that she wouldn't be further than the first trees, but I couldn't see her at all. I was starting to feel a little uneasy, so I loosened the reins and headed back again. This time when I heard my name, it was screamed. I was instantly covered in goosebumps. It sounded just like my sister, and she sounded scared. Instead of listening to my gut that was telling me to get out of there, I turned my horse around and headed to the woods. But she started tossing her head and sidestepping. She was not having any of it. I tried to calm her down, but she started to panic more. I decided that I would tie her off on a fence post and go check it out on foot. I started towards the trees. Looking back, I don't know what I was thinking, but at the time, I was trying to help my sister. It didn't take long to cross a small field and enter the woods. I started looking for her immediately, but I saw no sign of her. After a few minutes, I was ready to head back to the house, but as I started to head back to the trail on my horse, I heard the scream again. Further into the forest, I took off running, calling her name. She didn't respond, but... I just kept running. I knew she was here somewhere, and this far in, she may be lost. My parents wouldn't be happy if I left her out here. I had to find her. I kept running and calling for her, but she wasn't answering. After calling out a few more times, I stopped running. I realized that I was pretty far past any point I could remember. I started trying to trace my steps back and quickly realized that I was lost. I can remember this cold hitting me as I realized that I had no idea which way led back to the trail. It wasn't long before I heard my name again, only this time it was closer, in almost a whisper. I spun around looking frantically. The voice was wrong. It sounded like my sister, but it definitely wasn't her voice that I was hearing. I could hear something moving just out of my sight, and my hair stood on end. It didn't take long for me to make out the creature that was watching me. I heard my name again and looked right where it came from. I could make out this human shape, but it was all wrong. It was on all fours, kind of hunched over. It had a pout of some type and an animal skull over its head. But the eyes? The eyes were wrong. 
They were too human to be an animal. I screamed, and it smiled, lunging towards me. I turned and ran like my life depended on it, because as far as I was concerned, it did. This thing was fast, and I knew it was toying with me. I was panting and my body burned, but I wasn't stopping. Finally, I saw the trees thinning out in front of me, and I wasted no time in making it out of the trees. I could hear whatever it was calling my name from the tree line as I hurried to untie my horse. I ignored the calls and threw myself into the saddle. My mare needed absolutely no encouragement to get out of there. We were soon racing down the trail, as whatever it was followed us in the trees. My heart was racing and my palms were sweaty. As we rounded the corner and the house was visible, we didn't stop running. My mare was wide-eyed and terrified. I couldn't blame her. I knew that whatever it was had just followed us home. I rushed to my dad and told him what had happened, yelling for him to get his gun. He looked startled at first, but when he saw how scared I was, he met me at the gate, opening it quickly with his shotgun in hand. Whatever it was chasing me, it stayed in the trees. Dad shook his head as I told him what had happened. He knew that I knew better. I had been warned my whole life, but I didn't believe the warnings or the stories. After that, no one was allowed to check on the fence alone. We had to go in pairs. Don't be like me. Pay attention. These warnings may just save your life. Hi, Donovan. I've been looking for other people who might believe what I'm talking about. There are groups on the internet, and I've talked with people, but honestly, it all sounds made up to me, which doesn't help my confidence when I share this, but I think this is the place to tell my story. My wife had been bugging me for a few weeks. She asked me to set up security cameras on the perimeter of her home. She wanted a camera set up over the garage, too. A few random things had been happening around our house for a couple of weeks and my wife was pretty concerned. There were several nights when our trash can was moved. It was never knocked over or spilled, but it was moved across the yard. We have a fence and a gate that locks on the outside of our house. Three nights in a row, the lock was unfastened and the gate was open. My wife saw our dog in the front yard. I tried to tell her it was just neighborhood kids, but she persisted that it wasn't. So I went out and I spent a bunch of money and bought all these security cameras. I work long days, so it took a lot of coffee to get acclimated to staying awake and watching the cameras. The first couple nights, nothing happened. I was beginning to think my wife was going crazy. Maybe she needed more sleep. I was trying not to doze off on the fourth night. It was a Saturday. It was late, and I was awake because I didn't have to be at work early the next morning. First, I saw the camera in front of the garage blink out, and it went white for maybe a half a second. When the picture came back, our trash can was moved to the other side of the driveway. The camera on the side of the house turned off on its own. It just went black. I rewound the tape but saw the exact same thing I saw the first time. Just white for a flash. I went outside to check it out. It was quiet out, which is totally normal at 2am where I live. It's a pretty quiet neighborhood. I saw nothing out of place, except for that trash can. I grabbed the handle of the trash can to drag it back to where it belongs and pulled but it didn't budge. I couldn't move the darn thing. It felt like it weighed a literal ton. I leaned back and pulled it with both hands. That thing wasn't moving. I stood there dumbfounded. The overhead lights on the garage flickered. I tried lifting the lid off the trash can just to do something. It was stuck. The trash can was completely immovable. The lights flickered again and turned off. Everything went black. I heard a loud buzzing for a second, and the lights flickered back to life. The trash cannon moved again. Now it was near the curb. I started freaking out. This whole thing was way too weird. I ran back inside the house and locked the door. I watched the yard through the window for maybe about an hour, and nothing happened at all. I sat in front of the computer screen and watched the cameras. I was buzzing. I wasn't sure what I was hoping to see. I didn't believe in ghosts and I wasn't sure what could possibly be going on. The camera on the side of the house was still black. I kept glancing at it anyway, then it turned on. The gate was open and I saw my dog standing there. I forgot that I had let him out just a few minutes earlier. He was looking at something. 
I saw him raise his hackles like he was scared. Then both cameras turned off again, and the screens were dead. I got up and ran to the garage and opened the automatic door. My dog heard and ran to me. He was whimpering and his tail was between his legs. I was patting him on the head when I saw something move alongside the front yard. It was smallish and fast. For a second, I thought it was a cat or something, but it couldn't be. It had pale skin. I only saw it for a second, but I was sure. My dog whimpered and bolted in the house. The lights above the garage flickered again. I flipped on the switch to the lights inside the garage, but they didn't respond, and it went dark again. That buzzing sound returned and changed into this low hum. My eyes were adjusting to the dark, and I saw something in the shadows near the street. It was a short, pale kid. That's what I thought at first as it started moving towards me. I saw that its head was bulbous. It was too big to be a kid. It opened its eyes and revealed these large black orbs, and it blinked several times. The lights flickered again, and when they turned off, I heard this squealing noise. Like someone was burning rubber in their car, but there was no smell. Right as the lights came back on, I saw my trash can pop up and then blast straight into the air, and the whole thing was completely silent. I ran into the driveway and looked up, but the trash can was gone. It disappeared, and so did the little person or whatever it was that I saw. I just stood there and looked up at the sky for a long time. I locked the side gate, and even though it felt completely pointless, I went inside and I checked the cameras. I saw nothing in the side yard camera. It had blacked out, but the camera in the front of the garage was working. I rewound the footage. The trash can was sitting there. The lights above the garage flickered, and the screen went white, and when it came back, I was standing in the driveway, and the trash can was gone. I kept re-watching it over and over, looking for anything, a pale person or those giant black eyes, but there was nothing there. My wife was right to suspect something, but I still don't know how to explain any of it. For the better part of my 20s, I lived deep in the forests of Washington, between the lush woods and the lively coast to the west. Each year it feels as though dozens of local homes come forward with some tale about a cryptid encounter. And as I'm sure you know, anytime someone encounters a cryptid, they simultaneously forget how to work a camera. But real or not real, Cryptids are an interesting personality trait of Washington, and one of the main reasons I haven't moved closer to the city of Seattle, which I dearly love. Each Thursday evening, I find myself excited to attend the Cryptid Council. It's a weekly meeting where individuals come together to share their experiences. Every so often, we plan trips to locations of recent sightings. One particular Thursday, the day before Halloween actually, an elderly woman attended our meeting in shambles after claiming to have encountered a Sasquatch-like figure just hours before that afternoon. You should have seen the way we, my friends in the council and I, sprung to our feet. Never had an encounter been reported to the group so quickly, and it just so happened we were itching to have an outing over the holiday weekend. In no time, we made the executive decision to call off work the following day and to scramble home and pack our bags and head out before it got too dark. Our destination, really just an extension of this woman's backyard, was about 40 minutes away from my house. So, by the time we had made it to the woods and set up our camping equipment, the sun was nearly set. Now, by no means were any of us jumping at the opportunity to take part in a camping trip where we actually thought something scary would show face. After all, Nothing like that had ever happened before, so what gave us the reason to believe it would now? It was more so an excuse for the four of us guys to eat junk food, drink cheap whiskey out of flasks, and to tell ghost stories, and to tell ghost stories around a portable fire pit. A boy's weekend, if you will. So, as you can imagine, come about 2 a.m., we were all awoken by the most guttural yelping we've ever heard. We were taken aback. In situations like that, you don't spend a significant amount of time being groggy and waking up. It's like your instincts shoot along your spine, and we were all immediately on high alert. 
Tony was the first to say what we were all thinking when he asked, What the hell was that? Standing up from the ground, a wind caught my nose, carrying with it the most foul stench of urine and B.O. I quickly assessed our immediate surroundings, and having not seen anything, made quick work of smothering the remaining ashes of our fire as to minimize our visibility. Before any of us had the opportunity to ask anything else, or conjure up a possible response to Tony's question, a series of deafening whooping noises filled the air, chilling us to the bone. Charlie was the first of the group to sprint away, and none of us had to say a word. We were all right behind him, with no hesitation. After about 30 seconds of running, we came barreling into the back door of the elderly woman's home, who'd left the door unlocked in case we needed to use the restroom in the middle of the night. We quickly locked the door, pulled the blinds, and, and each staged ourselves at the various windows lining the backside of the house to peek outside. When the woman appeared at the top of the stairs, asking us what was going on, we quickly hushed her and turned our attention back to the outdoors. And that's when it stepped into view, emerging like a giant, even amongst the towering trees surrounding it. This thing must have been every bit of 11 feet tall, with dark brown fur covering it from head to toe, minus its bare face. It walked on two legs, almost like an ape, but there was something humanoid about it too, like Neanderthal, with beady eyes and a projecting mouth. We were all frozen in place and didn't dare to make a sound from within the house. I was certain that if we did, and this thing wanted to, it would have easily busted through the back door. Realistically, it must have stalked around the backyard for only a minute or so before vanishing into the woods from which it came. But truth be told, it felt like an eternity watching it. At the first sign of the coast being clear, we all huddled upstairs as to make the least noise possible and called 911. When the cops arrived, we were cleared to evacuate the property. The woman was taken to a local motel for the foreseeable few nights, and the boys and I packed back into my Jeep and hightailed it back to my house, a much safer 40 minutes away. The police never got back in contact with any of us after that night, leaving my friends and I to believe that nothing was uncovered regarding whatever it was we saw in that backyard. But after that, we never participated in a cryptid council outing again. Of course, the group bragged on us for returning with a hell of a story, but no picture to support our case, but we didn't even care. We all knew what we saw that night, even if it's not something we could explain away with words. And that in itself was enough for us all to decide to eat junk food and drink cheap whiskey from the comfort of our own homes from then on. Traveling has always been one of my passions. I have one of those maps of the United States, where you fill it in with pictures from each state, and the state's shape and everything like that. I have traveled to probably a third of the country, and I have stories from every state, but none beat the story of my last trip to West Virginia. This story sounds crazy, and I understand if you think I'm making it up. Everyone I've told thinks that. You read listeners' stories, though, so I'm pretty sure you won't think I'm crazy. At least, that's what I'm hoping for. I want this story heard because maybe it will help someone else who needs to hear that they aren't alone, that someone else has seen whatever this thing was. I always drive when I travel because that's half of the adventure. I had been on the road for a while, driving from Oklahoma to West Virginia is about a 15-hour drive with no traffic, so I stopped off for the night at a hotel. This allowed me to pick up a postcard to mail home along the way, another little tradition that I like to do when I travel through a state. I know that the next thing I tell you is when you're going to think I'm crazy. I was a few miles outside of Point Pleasant. I had stayed longer in Mount Vernon, Illinois than I had intended. So it was just around dusk as I was traveling eastbound. My destination was within 20 miles. I was jamming out to some old classic country, belting out George Strait, when something caught my eye. I slowed down and rubbed my eyes to make sure I wasn't seeing things. I was really struggling to understand what was happening, because I had just seen a huge gray man with wings spanned at least 10 feet, 
flying right next to my car. I shook my head and pulled over. Maybe I was just too tired. I sat in my car and decided maybe I needed a short nap. I set a timer on my phone to wake me in 15 minutes, but I couldn't go to sleep. I closed my eyes and immediately I could see the creature in my mind. I finally gave up and decided to finish heading into town. I pulled back onto the road and had barely rounded a curve when a hunched over figure appeared in a field directly in front of me. The thing was huge. When I first saw it, I swear it had red eyes. But as my headlights hit its face, the eyes reflected back at me. I slammed on my brakes. I was so freaked out. I really didn't understand what was going on. I watched this thing watch me. Eventually, it shifted, turning its gaze elsewhere and kind of shuffling away. So I started to continue my trip. It wasn't long before a new motion out of my side window caught my eye. I gasped and hit the gas. The thing was following me. It ran like a kid who was just learning to run, all awkward and unsure. But when it opened its wings and took to the sky, I couldn't outrun it. I sped up nearing 80 miles per hour, but it still kept up, its red eyes staring at me the whole time. So I increased my speed again. Now I'm going at least 90 miles an hour as I desperately try to outrun this thing. I was beginning to panic. I had no idea what was going on or what this thing was, but I wanted far away from it. Whatever it was never stopped following me, not until I hit the outskirts of the town. As I started to pass houses, it slowly fell behind, still watching me. I could see its red eyes in my rearview mirror. The sight was enough to leave me shaken to my core. As I reached town, my grip on the steering wheel loosened. I laughed out loud. I seriously have one heck of an imagination, but I was not ready for what was coming next. I was checking into the hotel. The clerk was being nice and was making small talk, and I'm sure I looked terrified and crazy, but she kept chatting away. She gave me my room number and my key card, and as I said thank you, she asked if I was traveling alone. When I said yes, she asked me if I was okay. I looked like I was running from something. I didn't think I should tell her what I saw, so I just told her that I had an odd experience on the highway heading in, and was ready to turn in for the night. She nodded and I headed to my room. I laid in that bed for hours, trying to justify the creature, until my hunger got the best of me and I decided to find a fast food place to grab a quick bite to eat. I was pulling into the drive through when the red eyes appeared again. I screamed. I couldn't help it. I was so exhausted and I just didn't have it in me to keep acting like things didn't faze me. I wasn't alone this time though. The car ahead of me started honking and the passenger was excitedly pointing ahead of us in the same direction. They didn't seem overly afraid though. At least I'm not the only one who can see whatever this is, was all I could think. I had completely lost my appetite though. I headed back to the hotel, pulled the blanket over my head and prayed for morning. I tried talking to my family about this when I got home, but they told me that my stories just get more and more creative. I gave up eventually, but I do need someone to tell me if they have seen the same thing. Hey Donovan, I hope you decide to read this. I think your listeners will really enjoy hearing about this, and it will help me process everything that has happened while we lived in this house. My dad was military, so we moved around a lot. Like, a lot a lot. It seemed like every four years we were getting stationed in another state. We had just been stationed in Colorado Springs, and I was seriously excited. I had missed the snow after being in Texas for the last four years. The house that my parents rented for us seemed pretty nice. It was really big, had more than enough rooms, and it even had an awesome basement. I was really excited about the basement. Having a room that was underground and pretty much soundproof from the outside seemed perfect. We had only been there for a couple of weeks, and we were all settling in pretty quickly. We were so used to moving that it no longer was a big deal. I had just finished setting up my drums in the basement, and was about to get the amp for my guitar plugged in and everything would be perfect. Things were coming along nicely, and I was very happy that my parents were letting me make this area mine. I hadn't been able to really play in a while. 
I sat back on the couch that they bought for me and strummed a little, testing the sound and ensuring I had it all tuned up and the amp dialed in just right. Suddenly, the room got colder. Didn't really phase me, though. This wasn't my first rodeo with a cold state. I leaned back, closed my eyes, and played my favorite song by memory. Having my own musical space away from my little brother was honestly perfect. No one could touch my stuff or mess with my settings. The peaceful feeling didn't last long, though. I was just hitting the second bridge when I heard it. It sounded like nails on a chalkboard and gave me goosebumps. I hate that sound. I opened my eyes and looked around wildly, trying to understand where it was coming from. That's when the lights started flickering. But, I mean, this house was pretty old, so maybe the wiring was janky. I decided to head upstairs. I mean, maybe my parents could contact the landlord and have someone come check out this wiring for us. I had made it about halfway up the stairs when the door slammed shut. I stopped in my tracks and stared at the door. What on earth is going on? I ran up the last of the stairs and tried to open the door. It wouldn't budge. Panic was taking over and I started banging on it. I was legitimately terrified. I screamed for my mom and my dad, even my brother, but no one was responding. I started trying to rationalize what was happening. If no one was answering, maybe they were playing a prank on me. Using this logic, I calmed down and went back downstairs. If they wanted to scare me, I wasn't going to act like nothing was going on. I had just started playing again when I started to feel the couch shift. I tried to ignore it though. I was trying to keep my cool. I didn't need to panic when I was stuck in a room and couldn't escape. But soon the movements got harsher. It was definitely jerking around. I pulled my feet up on the couch and grabbed the arm, trying to keep myself from getting hurt while whatever was happening. I knew this wasn't a prank, but what could I do? The door was jammed and I couldn't get out. So I started to try to talk to whatever was doing this. I told them that I meant no harm, and I asked them to please let me out. I only made them angrier. The movements got a lot more forceful, and the lights started cutting out. But that wasn't even the worst of it. The sound was back and ten times louder. It was so loud that my head was starting to hurt. I was officially terrified and didn't know how to get this to stop. The lights started to stay off for longer periods, on, off for 30 seconds, on, off for 30 seconds and over and over. Soon the couch stopped getting jerked around, but I kept my feet up. I was hopeful that whatever was happening was almost over. I was so wrong. The next time the lights went out, there was this low growl. And when they came on, there, standing about 10 feet in front of me, was a teenage girl, probably about 16. She was like a mist though. I could literally see my drums through her, but What really scared me was her eyes. They were like empty holes, pitch black and non-existent, and the blood drenching the front of her clothes. At that point, I screamed, but I think that just made her angry. She turned her eyeless face towards me, and the couch lifted in the air three feet before crashing down again. I was begging her to stop. She cocked her head at me, and this time when the couch lifted, it stayed. I was floating three feet off the ground watching this thing look at me without any eyes. She straightened her head before throwing it back. Across her throat was this huge cut. I screamed out again and grabbed the couch as it fell. The lights began to flicker again, as if I needed any help being more afraid. She was still there, watching me, until the fourth or fifth time the lights flashed. This time when they came on, she was gone. The door flew open and the room returned to normal temperature. I looked around the room, trying to make sure that I was really alone before standing up. I had never ran so fast up the stairs in my life. My parents still don't believe me. No one heard me screaming or begging for help. I never stepped foot down in the basement again. Hi Donovan, first let me say I love your show. I've had an encounter that really has me puzzled to say the least. This happened when I was hiking near Olympic National Park. It was a Sunday morning and the day looked like it was going to be beautiful. I'm about 20 minutes into my hike and then something catches my attention out of the corner of my eye. It was an unusual creature with these short legs. 
that I had never seen before. It was standing about 40 feet into the woods. At first I thought it was a bear or some other animal, but as I got closer, I noticed that this creature had a bright reddish brown fur. It had long arms and this humanoid face. It wasn't until later that I realized it might be some type of Sasquatch, but I don't understand why it was so low to the ground. I'm not really sure. I was scared, but also intrigued. I wanted to find out more about it. As I approached, it turned and quickly ran into the woods. I followed it for a few minutes, hoping to catch up with it, but I eventually lost sight as it disappeared into the trees. I don't know why I followed it. I just had this feeling like it wasn't dangerous. I don't know exactly what this creature was, but it looked kind of like a Sasquatch. All I can say is, whatever it was, its presence left me feeling a bit unnerved and curious at the same time. This is the craziest thing that I've ever seen. I live near Lake Superior in Wisconsin. I was out fishing as usual when I stumbled upon a very large animal that didn't look like anything I'd ever seen before. It was walking on the land and had these large teeth protruding from its mouth. It seemed to be hunting for something in the water. I quickly reeled in my line and made sure not to get too close. As I watched this creature from afar, I began to realize that it must have been some type of ancient creature from millions of years ago. Suddenly, this creature disappeared into the lake, never to be seen again. This thing was probably about 8 feet long. It had this bluish gray scaly skin, almost like a cross between a lizard and a fish, and an almost human-like face, and these massive teeth. I've seen fish before on Animal Planet that have a human-like face, and that's kind of what it looked like. Anyways, I've been back to my same fishing spot several times since, but I never saw that creature again. No one wants to be the person with the stick. Working in animal control, just showing up with the pole, makes you the enemy of the very animals you're there to help. When a wild animal becomes a danger to itself or to a community, someone has to do the job. There's the responder who tracks the animal, the one who tries to calm it down, and then there's me. I'm the one with the stick, and I hate using it. You know the one, don't you? the pole with the noose-like collar hanging from one end. Did you know that they come in different sizes? There are small ones for kittens and puppies and larger ones for raccoons and opossums. Larger ones yet for dogs and deer. If the animal's got a neck, we've got a noose that will fit. Pretty morbid, huh? You can see why I didn't like my job at the time. As far as the animals were concerned, I was the hangman. I never hurt them, of course. I never lost any wildlife on the job. That was never enough to change how I felt. On the day that this story takes place, we were responding to a call about feral cats. Feral was the word the caller used to describe them. That wasn't our word. All we knew was that an abandoned house in a poor neighborhood had been overrun by strays. The cats were starting to terrorize the neighborhood, looting garbage bins and cornering small pets and children. Something had to be done. We knew right away that the job wasn't going to be easy. The cats weren't going to come calmly with their paws up. They were going to need the noose. That day may have been the first time I was actually thankful to be the person holding the other end of that instrument. We took a look at the house before going in. The foundation was weak, crumbling and cracking, even on the outside of the home. The porch roof was slanted and sagging. We had walked through worse. After reviewing our safety precautions, we thought nothing of it. We weren't going to let an old building stop us from doing our jobs. Caroline went in first, speaking in the soft voice that I'd seen tame a dozen stray dogs. Max was behind her with a metal cage under his arm. That left me in the back, pole slung over my shoulder and sorry written on my face. I didn't want to take all those cats back to the shelter. I knew the majority of them would be euthanized. If we'd arrived sooner, Maybe that wouldn't have been the case. As it stood, the time it took us to respond to the call was too great. A different fate had already befell the cats. 
There were immediate signs of a fight, tufts of fur and small spatters of blood. Caroline spotted a claw laying on the floor, torn from its place on a cat's paw. It didn't seem like the cats had been killed. There had been a fight and they had abandoned the house. It made sense. Then something moved in the building, the sound of wood dragging across floorboards, and then a heavy thud. We asked if anyone else was inside. There was no answer. Max stayed in the first area to search for any cats that had stayed behind. Caroline and I went to investigate the sound. We found the entrance to the basement. The door was left open. Wide scratch marks lined the tile leading to the staircase. Caroline reminded me to have my pole ready. I didn't think to remind her that I was carrying the stick size for cats. I followed her into the basement. We never had a hope of capturing the thing that made those scratches. The basement reeked of dust and urine. It was pungent enough to make me gag even before I reached the bottom stair. Caroline was made of tougher stuff than me. Her eyes were alert looking for whatever animal we'd accidentally come to rescue. When I saw those eyes go wide, I knew we'd stumbled into something dangerous. She turned suddenly and ran by me, taking the stairs two at a time, just to put some distance between herself and the basement. I wasn't smart enough to follow. Instead, I looked. I looked and saw the creature that had scratched the floor. I saw the creature that had chased the cats from their den. It was the size of a shepherd, much too large for the small pole in my hands. It was hunched over a mound of rancid meat, rodents and squirrels and whatever else the cats had caught. Its knees bent and its shoulders slouched much like those of a man. If the lighting had been any worse, maybe I would have mistaken the creature for a squatter. Maybe I would have called the police instead of fleeing like my friend. The basement was well lit. There was no mistaking that bizarre nature of that thing huddled in the corner humanoid in shape but covered in scales. Think scales like an alligator. Its teeth were long and pointed. Its eyes blinked with two sets of eyelids. And when it blinked, it saw me. It lunged. I barely had time to raise the tool in my hands. I aimed the stick for the creature's chest, stabbing it down as if I'd carried a lance and not a noose. I saw blood. It fell, surprised either by my reflexes or by my reach and I hit those stairs even faster than Caroline had before me. I slammed the basement door shut and headed for the car where my friends were waiting. Caroline wouldn't speak of it. I told Max what I saw. He didn't believe me. His skepticism was earned when the police arrived. The next time someone entered that basement, the creature was gone. Caroline still calls me sometimes, asking if what we saw was real. I don't need that same reassurance. I don't need you to explain what this thing was, Donovan, because I know it was really there. That's all that matters to me. I still have the stick that I carried that day. The end of it is still stained with that creature's blood. Hey there, I'm a big fan of your channel, and I have a story I feel you'd definitely be interested in. It's my favorite to tell at campfires and sleepovers and things. But even though it sounds like any old dumb ghost story, it's true. It really happened. Even if no one I tell it to thinks so. When I was little, my family and I moved around quite a bit. My dad worked in construction, so we kind of adjusted based on whatever job site he was assigned to at the time. When this story took place, I was around 11. Young, but definitely cognizant, you know? I knew what was normal and what wasn't. We moved into this little apartment building a little ways outside of Chicago. And if nothing else, the place was definitely run down. I didn't mind really because I was a kid, but it was annoying to hear my folks arguing all the time. Since I was an only child, I had to get sort of creative when it came time to play. I came up with these intricate stories with my dolls and found this little crawl space attached to my room to play in when I wanted to feel hidden. So about that crawl space, as I said, I kept a lot of my stuff in there, so I usually left the door open. It would get stuck sometimes, and Lord knows I didn't want to accidentally trap myself in a tight space. After we lived there for a few weeks, I began to vaguely notice things in my room would be out of place. My dolls would be in totally different spots. 
My bed would be unmade, even if I was sure I made it. My books would be open, even if I hadn't touched them in a while. At the time, I assumed that it was due to my parents, my mom coming in to clean things up and moving all my stuff around in the process. But the thing was, my parents started commenting about it too. There was this one day, for instance, when my dad had to stay at work a little later than usual, and I was home alone for a few hours after school. This happened every once in a while, and really wasn't out of the ordinary. Like normal, I hung out in my room, playing with my stuff. The next thing I knew, my dad comes home screaming at me to come downstairs. Turns out, and I kid you not, our dishwasher was open, and there were plates, cups, utensils everywhere. At least half the load was thrown all around the room, all scattered. My dad, he thought I did it. In fact, he was sure, and he was pissed. Obviously, though, I wouldn't have done that. He had to spend nearly the entire rest of the night picking up pieces of broken glass from the floor. I felt awful. Anyway, a few days later, this happened. Stuff gets even weirder somehow. My mom wakes up with these massive bruises on her arms, like some serious scary movie activity. My dad is freaking out because not only is she all bruised up, but more and more random objects around the house start going missing including his work laptop. So then, this one day, my dad kind of has a freak out. I remember sitting in my room just minding my own business, when all of a sudden, my dad swung open the door and just barged in. He didn't say anything to me, or yell really, but he was tearing my room apart. Eventually, after the fact, I hurtfully realized that it was because he seriously thought I had stolen this stuff and hid it somewhere in my room. He keeps throwing stuff around, looking, and then the crawl space kind of catches his eye. This is where the freakiest stuff happened. As soon as my dad starts to walk up towards the crawl space to check out what's inside, the door slams open. Let me be clear, there is no draft in my room. I had some tiny windows that I always kept shut because there weren't screens and bugs freaked me out. So, in no way was there any kind of natural rhyme or reason for why my door randomly snapped closed the way it did. This didn't just scare the crap out of me either. My dad damn near screamed like a little girl. So we both kind of sit there in silence for a second, absorbing the situation. Then, my dad decides enough is enough. He walks over to the crawl space door and starts tugging at it anyway. Watching all this happen from my bed, it was interesting like I had a bird's eye view of what was happening. That's how I saw what was about to happen next, without even trying. I watched him tugging at the door, yeah. But then, my bookshelf that's faced towards him and the crawl space starts going crazy, like there's an earthquake or something. A book flies off, just one, and that's enough to make me scream bloody murder. My dad, luckily quick, noticed me yelling and noticed the bookshelf in enough time to jump the hell out of the way. Good thing he did too, since directly afterwards all of the contents of the shelf began to fall with a large wooden structure. So my dad reassesses the situation. Obviously I didn't do that, and obviously that wasn't natural, and he later apologized pretty profusely about the whole thing, without ever being specific as to what he meant. I'm sorry I was acting strange. And, I didn't mean to blame you for what was going on. He never directly used the word ghost, you know? But they say kids sense these things. I was a kid, and I definitely sensed something or other. We ended up moving out of that place about a month after the bookshelf incident. For that last month, things kept being strange. But nothing as violent as that happened. Since then, I haven't felt or seen anything like it. So I wonder what everyone thinks of this entire situation. In the light of day, it's a fact that big cats are always on the lookout for prey. Unless they only act like enemies for the camera. Either way, check these two out after the hard day's work of acting is finished. The trail cam video shows a cougar and a deer walking together calmly in the woods rather than running or chasing one another. The deer is actually following the cat. It's incredible. I'd love to know if you guys have seen anything like this. 
And on another note, the submission said that this was a bobcat, but to me it looks like a cougar, mountain lion. The tail seems much thicker than a bobcat's. Anyhow, I'd love to know your thoughts on the video and the actual cat in the video. And either way, it looks like the joke's on us.